So it would be really great to talk generally about the research programme and how the research is carried out and whether the research team is connected with the Huntington's Disease Association and how that partnership works. The research is technically separate from the HDA in that there's what we call a sponsor and that's the pharmaceutical company that makes the drug and in the case of the trial that was just completed and announced that was Ionis Pharmaceuticals which is a small Californian drug company. Um, then that company uh, sends the drug to clinical sites, each of which is a hospital, so an HD clinic in other words, run by uh, clinicians and researchers. Um, and that's really the, uh, the team that makes up the running of a clinical trial. So the HDA isn't directly involved in that, but if it weren't for the HDA, then all of our patients would have much more chaotic lives and many fewer of them would be able to take part in the trial uh, simply because they, you know, wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to make ends meet, they, would, they wouldn't be on the right benefits, they wouldn't have the right amount of help. So the HDA is really the glue that holds together the UK HD community by providing help and support and also by raising awareness of the research that's going on. So the HDA has been really helpful in educating people about what it means to take part in research, why it's important and how to do it. Um, and many of the patients that, that come to our clinic for research have found us and, and, and been encouraged to take part in research by the HDA. So essentially, although the, the team running the research is a relatively small team, the whole HD community, including the HDA, we're in this together and we completely depend on each other for everything. So you mentioned Ionis there and I didn't realise that the relationship between Ionis and funding the trials as well as the Roche partnership, so it'd be great if you could say uh, a little bit more about that. Yeah, so a funder of the whole project at the moment. So Ionis paid to run the trial that just completed it's a little bit more complicated than that because actually so many people are involved in running a trial like this that the money to make it happen really comes from lots and lots of places. So my salary is paid by the Medical Research Council, which is t UK taxpayers' uh, contributions, thanks. thanks to you, thanks to everyone else. That's paid via UCL, which is a university. Other people involved in the trial are paid to do their day jobs by the NHS. And there's also input from other charities like the Wolfson Foundation, um, the National Institutes for Health Research. So, um, it, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a trial. It takes a city to raise a drug. You know, funding comes from all, from, uh, all sorts of angles. Um, the, the role of Roche is that Roche has actually been involved in the program for several years. Um, I think as, as long ago as 2012 or 2013, Roche um, partnered with Ionis to help steer the drug into the trial and through the first trial in humans. Um, the big announcement in December, as well as the top line results of the trial, was that Roche had opted in to take over the program. So from the next trial onwards, uh, it will be Roche that leads the trial with Ionis helping out rather than Ionis leading the trial with Roche helping out. And Roche will be funding the next big trial. A uh, lot of people have been asking about how do I get on the research programme, you know, and how, how do I get on the trials? Could you say a little bit more about how that happens? Yeah, it's a good question. It usually happens at the clinical site. So once a, once a site is confirmed as being involved in a trial, what they will do is sit down with several members of the research team and say here is our database of people who have said that they are interested in taking part in research and taking part in trials. That Sometimes that's a standalone list, other times that will be supplemented by the database of participants in the Enrol HD study mm -hmm. and perhaps that's something we can come back to. Mm -hmm. The Enrol HD list gives us information about what clinical stage people are at, what their symptoms are, their medications, their past medical history, so it's a really, really useful list for figuring out which of the people who are interested in research might be eligible according to the criteria. And so basically what will happen is that 
the, the, the site staff themselves will sit down and, and say, we have however many places, let's say we have 10 places in this trial, what people are eligible, and they may sort of draw a list of 20 who are most likely to be eligible, um, and, it, and, and it can also come down to things like where people live, um, whether we know that someone has a trial partner who can help them out, um, you know, whether they have a, a good track record of being involved in previous research, and we know that they show up to appointments and that they, you know, that, that, that they have a good understanding of um, what, it what it means to be involved in a trial. Um, the final decision about whether someone's eligible, though, is in the hands of the sponsor, which is the drug company. So basically, we, um, we enter someone into the screening process, so they sign a consent form at the, on day one of the trial, but you don't get the drug on day one. You enter a screening period where you may have lots of in investigations, examinations, blood tests, brain scans, all sorts of other things. And then at the end of the screening period, we send uh, anonymized information about that person to the sponsor and it's the sponsor that finally gives us a thumbs up or a thumbs down on whether that person meets the criteria for having a place in the trial. If there's a thumbs up there, that's when we can book them in and start to give them the study medication. Okay, so there's quite a process to go through. So for example, if I won the lottery next week, I couldn't buy myself onto that programme. No. Uh, it, it can't be done, it's absolutely impossible. Yeah. We've, had, we've had lots and lots of emails since the announcement from people all over the world who want to move to London and take part in the trial. The first thing is, you cannot be in any trial if you're not eligible for NHS treatment. So there's no private way, paid way of getting into the trial. Even if you see a neurologist privately, you, uh, you'd have to be seen in the NHS Huntington's Disease Clinic before you could be given a place in the trial. And uh, chances are, you know, I think broadly speaking, moving from one country to another on the off chance of being in a trial is a very bad idea. The criteria are very factual for the most part. So it's how old are you? What is the severity of your Huntington's disease? What are your uh, you know, uh, scores on certain other tests? What medications are you on? Um, do you have any other medical problems? And that all um, is factored in and people basically are, are either obviously not eligible or definitely clearly eligible or somewhere in between and that's what the screening process is about. It's about really examining people really closely to figure out who's going to be the best people for the trial. So when the, the news came through about the latest research I've got a news flash on my phone and I've been waiting 32 years for this kind of information. I know that in my own mind when I read it I immediately read Cure but this isn't a cure, even though it's really exciting research. Is that the case? Yes. Um, I think there's a problem with that, uh, that very idea of a cure. Um, very few diseases have been cured, you know. We have effective treatments for things like pneumonia, uh, you know, bacterial infections, say, mm -hmm. but those still exist in the world. Um, so there are treatments. Diabetes is another good example. We know the cause of diabetes is in insulin deficiency. People get treated with insulin, but that's not a cure. HIV, really effective treatments. People lead normal lives, essentially, completely normal lives, normal life expectancy. And those treatments are getting better every time, but we don't have a cure. Um, you really only find out that you've cured something in retrospect. So this, uh, this drug, Ionis HTTRX, is not a cure. Okay. It's the first drug that definitely lowers production of the Huntington protein, which is the known cause of Huntington's disease. And that's huge. You know, the news of the gene discovery in 1993 was the biggest news we've ever had in HD. But I think that this news about this trial is better news. The 93 discovery was, this is the cause of HD, this is what you need to solve. Uh, lowering that Huntington protein in the nervous system is such good news. But you're right, it's not a cure. If this drug turns out to be phenomenally effective, best case scenario, it's a treatment that would need to be injected regularly into the spinal fluid in order to prevent the onset of HD in people who've inherited the mutation. So, and I think it's really debatable about whether that's a cure, because if it worked absolutely brilliantly, you'd still have to have regular injections into the spine. 
Um, some people would call that a cure, other people wouldn't call it a cure. A cure is a pill that you take once and you never have to think about HD again. That's a theoretically possible future, but this development is far from that. And importantly, we don't even know if it works to slow down or prevent the disease. I think we have a very good chance that it will, but until we actually show that it does, what this is, is a proof of principle, a really important breakthrough at the biochemical level, uh, and a really strong sign that we now need to move into this big trial to test whether the drug works, but it's not a cure. So one of the other questions that I've been asked, and I'm sure other people in the community have been asked, is does this change your opinion about whether you should be tested or not? So I would love to know what your thoughts on that are. So I think as a, as a doctor that looks after people with HD, and also as a member of the HD community who has many friends with HD, many friends who have the mutation and many who haven't been tested who are at risk, it's not for me to say whether someone should or shouldn't get tested. Um, it's a very personal decision. Many things factor into that decision and I'm not even going to try and list them because they're different for every person, but they're huge things. For many people, what's happening in research and what the future may hold is one thing that they take into consideration when they wake up in the morning and say, should I get tested for HD today or not? Um, but I think it should be on you know, for most people, it should be a very small part of that decision. So, personally, I don't think anyone should get genetically tested on the basis of this announcement that we've lowered the mutant Huntington protein in this first in human clinical trial. I think if someone was on the brink of making that decision to get tested anyway, and research was a very important part of that decision, uh, you know, I think it would be reasonable for perhaps that one person to allow this news to influence that decision. But I don't I think for almost everyone it, it's not it's not news that should cause them to get tested. What we can say is that the future will all being well, and when I say the future I mean the next two to three years, will bring trials of drugs like this one that we've just tested in people who have the mutation but don't have symptoms of HD. So these would be trials to try and prevent the onset of HD. And those trials will almost certainly enrol people who've already had a genetic test. So they've already had a positive predictive test for the HD mutation. Um, that said, there's no need to rush into any of this. Um, what I think, if, peop if people are wondering whether they should get tested on the back of this news, the simple short answer is no. The medium length answer is, if, you're, if your thinking might be changing, it's always a good idea to get referred for genetic counselling. There is no commission involved in genetic counselling. The counsellor is going to be perfectly happy whether you get tested, whether you don't get tested, or whether you just keep seeing them once every two months for ten years and never make a decision. Those are all perfectly fine. Um, and I think the genetic counsellors are actually best, the best people to talk to about what this news might mean and what the future might hold. Ed, I want to say a big thank you uh, for coming today and answering all our questions. That was super. Thank you. Thank you.